Weatherbell Analytics, meteorologist Joe Bastardi. Welcome to the Saturday Summary. Uh, taking a look at the sea surface temperatures, the red bomb continues to go off in the Northeast Pacific. That's going to grow increasingly significant as we head for winter. The, uh, we're already looking at the upcoming winter, and when you see those red bombs in there, generally it means there's going to be a lot of cold air pouring into the United States, most likely the central or eastern part of the United States. Um, and what we've also noticed is a diminishing of water temperatures in the Gulf and off the southeast coast, too. So we'll watch these trends and see how that, uh, that uh, pans out. Um, you can see what's left of the El Nino in here, a little cool water coming off uh, South America there. Uh, speaking of reduction of water temperatures, this was five days ago. And this was record, uh, you know, at the end of the heat wave, there's almost record warm water off the uh, eastern seaboard. In some cases, it was record warm water, but it has cooled considerably, as you can see, uh, to a point where, I mean, this is about as cold as you see the water ever get at this time of the year, this kind of anomaly, six, five, six uh, C below normal in here, three to six C below normal. So it's a pretty impressive, um, I guess, you know, you're sticking your tootsies in the be uh, water at Virginia Beach, a little bit colder than what you might bargain for. Um, uh, the dust is uh, getting pushed further north here. In fact, uh, this is the first uh, wave that we've seen push the dust up to 20 north. The second one is back in here. And this wave is of great interest to me. Um, again, our weather bell preseason forecast said, well, less than normal activity in here. But once you got northwest of there, we were looking for scattershot development, some of it in close. And so... Here's the wave axis now, and what we're noticing is the models have a very distinct move northwest of heavy precipitation, and I think about day six, this may be uh, around the Bahamas and off the uh, southeast coast about day seven. Now, my take is that we're going to see a gradual development of it uh, once it's out of the main development region, and so next week at this time, we could have uh, something from the tropics right off the South Atlantic coast there. Uh, temperatures so far for the month of June, or excuse me, month of July, you see this northeast-southwest quarter of warmth uh, from Ontario uh, into, uh, into uh, the mid-Atlantic states and the Carolinas over here. And there you see the corresponding cold uh, to the west. It's been a cool month in California, and it's been cool in the Pacific Northwest, as you can see. It's been warming up in the Rockies. It's getting hot out in California now. Um, but this is, uh, this is pretty interesting stuff here in that uh, we did uh, the, the reversal we forecasted in this area, which had been cool overall, did occur. So there's a forecast verification. Now, we've had a lot of scorching hot weather in Europe. There's no question about it. But when you look at the deviations from normal during the month of July here versus the heat over here, you can plainly see... That while, and I'm not, I, listen, I am not knocking the heat wave or trying to downplay the heat wave. I am trying to say that they're, the way people report stuff is they will jump on this and they won't tell you about this over here, but we'll tell you about it. And there it is, as you can see. Um, now, I want to go over this because what happened, what has happened here is the big ridge of Western Europe has gotten squeezed north by this jet cutting underneath. Now, when you see negatives in here, and this is a five-day mean beginning tomorrow, see negatives in here, it's generally warm across the United States. Even if you have a trough, like we, we're going to have in the southeast, the air mass is normal, maybe a little below. When this block or positive comes back, that's when there's problems. And there you see it coming back here in day 10, uh, excuse me, day 6 through 11. And then the 11 to 16, it's all the way back here. You can see the deep trough over the eastern part of the United States. But uh, what may happen here is that uh, the ridge goes back up in Europe. And when it does, whenever you get these deep troughs like this, you usually get resistance to them. So it'll refire the Atlantic Ridge, and this will back up uh, toward the western part of the United States after that. But not before there's yet another significant cold outbreak that the U.S. models caught. From 15, what I do is I look at 15 days out and I say, okay, what does week two look like? The European model had no idea of this cold that was uh, just, that just came through in the central part of the United States from 15 days out. And the cold is coming next week. There's going to be a reinvasion of the cold, as you'll see. 
uh, the European just missed that completely. So this, uh, the G, you know, people people that follow me know them. Uh, he's always hammering the GFS, not all the time. Not, you know, I, I I'm telling you, the GFS when it looks like it's going to be right, I got no problem with it, and it, it's been doing a better job. Well, here's a day one through six temperatures. You can see the heat up in the northeast and the growing warmth in the western part of the United States. There's the 6 to the 11, and there's the 11 to 16. So uh, we've got a big pool of cool uh, to start the month of August over the lakes and into the east and uh, to some extent down the plains. And here's the precipitation. You can see the advancement of this tropical wave they're going to be watching. we got a trough to buckle in here. And that's when you can have it trying to come up. I, I mean, it could be a significant feature, seven to ten days. But right now, the European is just taking it straight out, all right, and developing it. But it develops it out of the main development re region. North of 20, uh, 22, 23 north is where it starts coming together. And, and, and the reason I'm jumping on this or saying, hey, we got to look out, is because this, this pattern that is setting up in the tropics for this in, this hurricane season, it is moving along the line of what we envisioned back in the spring. So when you start seeing things respond to the ideas in the spring, and those of you got on the Weather Bell site April 7th, we put that out. And so we'll see how that turns out overall. But if it's moving along that idea, it generally means you, you may have had some kind of ideas uh, that weren't merit. I never say... Uh, you know, you never say, well, I'm absolutely right. I said, well, there's some merit to them. Okay, so uh, here's a big cold. Uh, uh, upcoming five days, you can see France below normal, finally. And, um, and we got just very, very cold air in Russia over here. And there we are in the 6 to 11. And the 11 to 16, it goes back. And what will happen is Europe may have another heat wave. And so, uh, so here we are. I'm telling you, Europe may have a, another heat wave. And yet you saw how massive the cold was. The cold was more impressive than the warmth was, right? See that? See that? The cold that's coming, more impressive than the warmth. But what do you think is going to grab headlines if it starts getting hot again? Um, sea ice right now, Arctic sea ice is running below where it was in the record-breaking low year of 2012, but I suspect it'll try to stay up here uh, midway between the st uh, two standard deviations and the record low here. And part of the reason is it's actually kind of cool in the Arctic. Uh, the, the temperature, the temperature this summer in the Arctic, as as all the summers that we've seen for several years now, is not getting that much above normal. Of course not, because it it shows you the limitations of a lot of this. You know, I tell CO2, uh, tell people a lot of times uh, when you look at the nature of carbon dioxide, it's sort of like a filament in a light bulb. Okay. And, and imagine extra, well, let's put it this way. Imagine the electricity is the extra carbon dioxide coming into the system, all right? It only, no matter how much comes in, it can only uh, use what the filament has capacity to, you know, make light with, right? Either that, you got to get a different filament. Well, when you look at what carbon dioxide does, it's sort of like that. It's only... There's only so many bands where it can absorb that radiation that can then, I guess, re-radiate back in to the water vapor and things like that. So you can, you can turn on that light and you could double and triple and quadruple the electricity coming in, but the filament will not light it up any further than what it's capable of doing. And that's very interesting because I just got back from the uh, climate conference in D.C. and Lord uh, Christopher Monckton. I mean, he just, he just, is a guy's amazing character to me. Um, he proved that the, that the sensitivity to CO2, nobody says CO2 doesn't cause some warming, okay? It's just that it's very difficult to tell how much warming giving the entire system because every, everything else in the system has such great magnitude. But what Moncton proved up there was it's not 4.5 to 5C, it's 1.2C, which, you know, I, we probably um, we've probably uh, achieved half of that uh, already, and uh, that's the other that's the other factor. The so what factor? If it warms, the Earth is greener than it's ever been in the satellite era. By the way, here's an interesting fact, and I read this. I can't remember the exact amount of money it would cost. 
think it was $300 billion. I'm not sure. But do you know uh, if you planted enough trees around the world the size of Canada, let's say we had an increase in greenery that was the size of Canada, not just Canada, but all over the place, that would, that would wash that CO, the extra CO2 out of the air. All right. And I'm sitting there, when I read this paper, I said, well, how come we want to spend $93 trillion on trying to stop something that uh, if we continue to see the earth get greener or we plant more trees, we'll be able to uh, do away with? So, you know, when you actually go to these uh, things and you see uh, the, the wealth of knowledge of the people there, the many, many PhDs that are there, you know, I, I, I gave a keynote speech at the end of it and I it was the dumbest man in the room ending their conference, you know. I mean, they got guys in there so smart that they just, you know, communicate with their eyebrows. But, <laughs> but when you go and look at all this, you know, you, you have to just sort of roll your eyes and smile because uh, uh, as, as happens in many things, there's a, there's a big deflection going on, in my opinion. But what do I know? I always tell, you know, uh, some people interview me, I say, why would I not? want the weather to get more extreme because the more extreme the weather gets the better it is for business right so you know what up what, what i should do is if i was just worried about that is yes it's getting as extreme as possible and the only place to go for your weather is to come to me and put me on tv 24 so no <laughs> You tell the truth, or at least you tell people what you think, and you can go look for yourself. Okay, I've ranted and raved for quite some time. Uh, I will end this this way, because we should all smile and enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got.